Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody. It is Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. I am David Demzowski, founder of the Financial Bin and host of Financial Bin Radio. Before I introduce you to our guest today, let me share some quick notes. First off, don't forget to pick up your copy of Entrepreneur Intervention, Triumphs and Failures of Entrepreneurs. You can do so for just 99 cents on Apple's iBookstore, Kindle, Nook, and Sony Reader. You can also get a paperback copy for just under 10 bucks at Amazon and CreateSpace. Go to FinancialBin.com and click on the book section at the very top next to the login button for more information. Now, secondly, we're in the editing and formatting process for Landlord Intervention. I'm actually, a couple, I'm actually most of the way through, about 75% of the way through, uh, editing and formatting that book. Uh, this is a book by a gentleman, actually my, my father-in-law, his name's Joseph Brown, who put it together for me. Uh, he's been in the business, the real estate rental business for over 20 years, about 25 years actually, and he gives you a fantastic step-by-step how-to guide for free to how to begin your own career as a landlord, and we plan to uh, release this in May 2012, and we're also in the collecting submissions for wealth intervention, and we're going to release that later this year. Now, let me introduce you to today's guest. His name is Danny Kofke. Uh Danny is a special education teacher in Georgia and the author of two personal finance books, How to Survive and Perhaps Thrive on a Teacher's Salary, and a Simple Book of Financial Wisdom, Teach Yourself and Your Kids How to Live Wealthy with Little Money. Danny, welcome to Financial Bin Radio. It's great to have you. Hey, David. Thanks so much for having me on. No problem at all. Let, let's jump right into it here. Uh, can you give the, the listeners, can you kind of take us through your journey to, as, as you became a teacher and then venturing into the personal finance realm? Well, actually, yeah, the, the books kind of came. It was just kind of a, a fluke thing, I guess. It's the way it sometimes happens. You just get uh, the ball rolling and you just never know what happens uh, with it. Sure. But I started off as a teacher. Uh, my wife, Tracy, was a school teacher as well before becoming a stay at home mom um, when we had children. But uh, during the course of the time that she was a teacher and I was a teacher before having children, we knew eventually we had a plan that we wanted her to be able to stay at home when, when, we, when we did eventually have children. So we, even though we had two incomes coming in, we tried to live off of one because, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I make a, a little over $40,000 a year. So knowing that as a teacher's salary, it would be very difficult to raise a family on that alone if we had a lot of credit card debt, huge mortgage payment, car payments, and those types of things. So sure. we, this was in the early in the early 2000s, so we were very weird at that time compared to other people. We weren't just blowing money, going out all the time. We actually had one car for three years. I rode my bike to work, made fun of, and all that. But we had our eyes on a bigger prize. And I think some of my colleagues saw that in me and saw that in us. And even though you know, people were living like there was no tomorrow, I think there were some people that did realize, gosh, we just can't go along doing this forever because it's going to catch up with us. And, you know, five years later it eventually did. But um, but at that time people said, gosh, uh, you guys really know what you're doing with your money. You should write a book to help us out. And uh, I really didn't give it too much thought at the time. And then fast forward a couple of years later, at that time we just had one daughter, Ava, and one weekend, Tracy and Ava were out of town, and I'm not very good with idle time, and I, I think maybe God just put it in my head to sit down and, and just start a book. So I did, and over the next three or four months, I completed it, and honestly, I just thought it was really cool to have my words on paper. I thought, wow, this would be neat one day to show the kids and be kind of a cool thing, and I let a few family members and some friends read it, and someone suggested uh, that I should try to get it published. And like I knew nothing about the publishing industry, really, like I mentioned before, I didn't have an intention on having that done, but... But um, I started doing a little research, and then for your listeners that don't know, to get with one of the big publishing houses, they usually require a literary agent. And I really didn't want to go that route, so then I just started looking around uh, some more, and I found a couple of publishing companies that would take unsolicited manuscripts, send it off, and then one of them uh, accepted it. I did have to pay an upfront fee for it, and I kind of looked at it like, a, I guess, going into business that uh, you know I'm an unknown author, so uh, they're not just going to spend a lot of money on me because it could fail. That would be a good way to run a business. But there were some ways that I could earn that money back. So I went into it looking at it like that, and then I decided, wow, this is kind of cool. I have a book out in my first book, How to Survive on a Teacher's Salary. Um, It's definitely kind of the story of how Tracy and I got to the point that we were able to have her uh, stay at home when we did have our first child. Um, And and the thing is, you know, with our story, everyone's story is different, and ours is too. We actually taught overseas for a couple of years, so that helped uh, 
save helped us save some money and we moved uh, out of florida when the housing market was good didn't try to time and it just uh, so happened to be that way so there, there are some things in that book that may not relate to anyone or to everyone and that's why i wanted to write another book because uh, with my second book a simple book of financial wisdom teach yourself and your kids how to live wealthy with little money uh, that just came out last september so september of 2011 and I, I actually I started my first book in 2005. So fast forward there six years. In that time, we added another child to the mix. Uh, Tracy still uh, remained at home, and we still continue to live off of my teacher's salary. And despite that, we have no debt except our mortgage. We invest each month for our retirement. We have an emergency fund in place. And really, I think we live a pretty wealthy life on a moderate income because I have the freedom to pursue a job that may not pay that large of a salary. And I know it's hard to complain right now because there are so many people struggling and many wish they could have any type of job. But I think most would agree that teachers, uh, we're definitely in that moderate level uh, income area and most teachers don't get into it for the money. If they did, their college professor <laughs> lied to them. Uh, it's okay, but uh, definitely you kind of have to have a passion for it first. So that's kind of where I wanted to come up with this second book that I think uh, I could just – not just target one specific audience, but I think it relates well to anyone, whether you're a business owner, a CEO of a, of a corporation, a radio show host, teacher, fireman, police officer, and all areas in between. Just wanted to give some specific financial advice and some of the things that we've learned over the course of our financial journey to help people manage their money better. And let's face it, we really, really, I think, need that today more than ever with the, the economy being what it is. No I, I, no, I couldn't agree more, and I, I really think, um, you know, I mean, the people people like you that actually go out there and do it, you know, many people talk about it, paying down debt or paying off student loans or, or, or cutting back where they can or living off of one salary, but not enough people go out and do it, like especially right now. I mean, now's the time to really get get that get your financial house in order and really kind of put yourself out there and set yourself up for when things do get better. And, uh, right, and you they know, will, and they will, yeah. and that's you know, that's kind of what I try to tell people right now, that times will get better. We go in cycles, and I know it's hard to see that when you are knee-deep in debt and you don't know how to get out, but it will get better. And what I try to hopefully tell people is just remember this time, that when times are better, don't make some of the same decisions that put you in your current situation in the future. Uh, I, you know, exactly. I go back to people that, that went through the Great Depression. Many of them don't drive a Rolls Royce. They don't live in 5,000-square-foot homes but most of them have enough money in the bank to cover a week, a month, two months' worth of living expenses because they know what t tough times are. In my generation, right. uh, being 36, we've never really experienced this before. We've always been told, ah, save for that rainy day. Well, unfortunately, many of us are caught now without umbrellas. So that's where, to me, I'm hoping that this is a big wake-up call. And people are, um, you know, they're being forced to change their ways, but I hope they learn some valuable lessons and they stick with it over time. Danny, do you think this information should be taught in schools and colleges? Why or why not? Oh, absolutely, 100% yeah. yes. Because let's face it, parents aren't doing a good job of it. Uh, look, look around, and we see how many people are in debt. So I think school is good. I mean, as a teacher, obviously, I'm for education. But I think sometimes we do teach topics in school that really aren't that relevant. And I'm okay for teaching things just to learn because I think it's important to have parts of our brain work and higher-level thinking, and I think that's great. But, man, think about it. I mean, we all learned in high school the, the characters of Beowulf. How many times have we discussed that since high school? Or we memorized the periodic table. Um, how many of us have used the periodic table in our lives? Not many. But if you have a class full of 35 students, how many of them are going to have to balance a checkbook? Well, 100% of them if they want to stay out of debt. How many of them are going to have to pay income taxes? Well, all of them unless they want to be like Wesley Snipes and, and go to jail. So, I mean, there, there are certain things that I think that we can teach kids that are relevant and just the basics. We don't have to get that in depth, but, you know, how to do a basic income tax return, how to create a spending plan, how to balance a checkbook, those things I'm hoping, and maybe the economy and being what it is, Maybe there is some shift, and I know some schools are adapting some more personal finance uh, curriculum mm -hmm. in, into their uh, the, the way they study, but I think it is a, a desperate, desperate need right now. And hopefully, like I said, some schools are paying attention and are going to uh, include some of those uh, topics in their in their studies. Did, did your school do anything with personal finance, or do you bring it to, into the classroom at all? 
No, I, I, I do special um, education right now. And the students I teach, they have IQs under 30, so pretty low, okay. wheelchairs, too, okay. feeding us. Oh, they okay. don't think, so it's kind of, it would be above them. But, no, and, and it kind of really, it, something that opened my eyes a few years ago, um, I was asked to, to give the state test um, here in Georgia, CRCT, and every state it's something different, but it's a statewide test uh, for, for here. It's for third graders, and I had to read it. It was another special needs uh, uh, student, higher functioning, but um, they, they needed the test read to them. So I was doing it, and, you know, just I read the entire thing to him and broken up into different days, but I just realized afterwards that there were there were a couple, uh, you know, I guess ec- ec- um, economics type questions on it, but they mm. were there really wasn't much, and that kind of opened my eyes because I didn't know uh, being in special education, I really don't know the core standard curriculum that a gen ed student right. would learn, but it did show me that we really even in the standards there is not a lot of meat in that to teach uh, children money matters. So uh, there is a desperate need, and actually. Since you mentioned it, I'm actually I'm working on it right now. I don't know when it will come out, but I'm actually starting to write a book um, kind of to help parents teach their children how to manage money. And I just kind of want to break it up into di- different age brackets and just kind of give them uh, what some, some tips that they can do to ensure their children uh, don't make some of the same mistakes that they have. Sure, absolutely. Uh, now, and actually, kind of building off of that a little bit, I don't, I don't want to give too much of what you plan on writing in the book, uh, mm-hmm. next book away, but... You know, what conversations do you feel parents should be having with their children? What, what's specific? Oh, I think open and honesty is just the best policy in most things. But even with me, I mean, right now I don't have teenagers, so I know it's going to be different. You know, 10 years down the road, two teenage <laughs> girls. Sure. Uh, you know, who, who knows? I might be a traveling salesman, uh, you know, or wait 25 <laughs> days out of the month. But, uh, but even right now, I have a 7- and a 4-year-old. But I started early with Ava, my 7-year-old, when she was 3. We did basic chores every week. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not a big fan of paying people for things that they should be doing. But I made an exception here with her because I wanted to teach my money management principles first. So her basic chores, you know, making her bed, uh, cleaning her room, basic things that, that most three-year-olds can accomplish. And we had a chore chart set up, and every day that she would do them, we'd check them off. And at the end of the week, she would get paid if she did all of her chores. She'd get paid <laughs> as only a dollar a week. But we have three jars. One was labeled giveaway, one savings, and the other spending. And upon getting paid, she knows first you put 10% or a dime in the giveaway jar, 25% or a quarter would go in the savings jar, and the rest would go in the spending jar. And it just worked wonders, especially when she got to be four and five. That's when they, you know, we go to Walmart, and she always wants something at Walmart. Never an argument. We'll see how much money you have in your savings or spending jar. If you don't have enough, you'll have to save up a little more to buy it. So it's just a great, great principle. Then when uh, Ava turned six, I upped the ante a little bit, and I said, you know, those things that you've been doing right now, those are expected of you as a household member, but I'm going to give you a 50% raise. But what you're going to have to do now is every week you're going to have to gather the garbage around the house and bring it to the main garbage can for me to take out. And also you're going to have to clean your bathroom. This includes wiping the mirror down, scrubbing the toilet, and Tracy showed her how to do this. And then she actually she, she caught on pretty well, and she enjoys doing it, and, and she gets $1.50 a week now. Um, but what I wanted to teach her at that point, I thought now that she had the basic money management, at six, I want to show you, you know what, if you work harder than others and go above and beyond, because I'm sure most six-year-olds aren't scrubbing their toilet, you will right. usually be compensated for that. So little things like that is kind of, um, you know, kind of what we try to do with our children. And another thing, like I said, just honesty. Um, I... I tell them, both of my children, and even though Ella being four, she may not understand it totally, but I explain this is how much money I make a month. Uh, I pay for the mortgage, I pay for the electric, for the food, and this is what I'm responsible for, and this is what we have left over. And, you know, this is the reason why if I say, no, we can't do it this month, or go, you can't have this this month, it's not just because I'm the meanest dad on earth. It's because we're making the decision, and this is how much money we have coming in. And, you know, it's, it's great. I, Ava sometimes now, being seven, she sees some of her friends that have more than she does. And she'll come home and say, gosh, Dad, why can't we have a bigger house, or why can't we have more toys, or whatever. And I'll say, actually, you know what? You can, definitely. But something's going to change. Either, A, I'm going to have to get a different job, so you enjoy having me at home, and she actually attends the same school I teach at, so I get to drive her every day. I see her during the day. Oh. Said, so that will ha- that, that'll change. And I said, you also like having Mommy at home, don't you? When you get home from school, she raised you. Uh, she was home with you till the time you went to kindergarten. I said, now she's home when you get off of the bus. I said, well, that's going to change, too. You're going to have to go to the after-school program, and you probably won't see Mom until 6, 30, 7 o'clock at night. But we'll have a bigger house, and we'll have nicer things. And then she'll always say, you know, Dad, I think we kind of have it pretty good as it is, and then she just kind of goes off and plays. But those are the things I just kind of open it, and not that I would change what what we do if she wanted bigger things, but I just kind of Mm -hmm. want to give that explanation to her that, 
yes, certain people, they do have more than we do, but there's also a price to be paid for that. And I think sure. going back to the, the current economic situation, I think that's why so many people are in financial trouble is they didn't associate, you know, if I do A, then B is going to happen. If I sign up for a five-in-one five arm, when the interest rate adjusts, I'm not going to be able to afford it. Or if I put $5,000 on a credit card and I just make the minimum monthly payment, well, then I'm going to end up paying almost twenty grand. So I think a lot of people, we just, it, we're so in a society, as I see it, I want it, I'm going to buy it right now. And a lot of us do not think about the future ramifications of those decisions. So that's kind of where I want to go with them right now. At a young age, just kind of be open with it and explain it to them. And as parents... I mean, I know, and I've talked to my pastor at church about this, money still remains this taboo topic. He'll say people will come to him with marital problems, drug abuse, uh, mm-hmm. spouse cheating, but money is still something people are so embarrassed about, and I think we need to get away from that, and especially when we're talking with our kids. If you've messed up, that is great because kids learn from our mistakes. Every kid wants their parent to mess up. It's just kind of one of those things that, because they, they want to say, gosh, they're not perfect. So if you have right. messed up with money, tell your child, you know what, I really did. But the important thing is, I'm learning from this mistake, and I'm not going to allow it to happen again because we all mess up. But the important thing is that we grow and learn from them. Well, uh, building off of that then, Danny, what is one maybe day-to-day lifestyle choice that people can make to better their situation? And then maybe, also maybe if you want to touch on, what's the biggest difference that you find in your life between you and your peers? All right. uh, First, uh, the biggest thing that someone can do right now, and this can apply to everyone, is for one month, walk around with a piece of paper and a pencil and write down everything you spend. There are so many people right now, when I give financial discussions or try to help people uh, financially, they'll say, I don't have any money, I can't make ends meet. They have a new coach bag or they have a new pair of shoes, they have a new iPhone. And I'll say, well, you do have money, you're just spending it in this way. And a lot of people, they just don't realize where their money is going. And if you don't know how you're spending it, it's very hard to control it. So that to me is key. Uh, and that, you know, I could give some generic tips, you know, the latte factor, don't buy coffee or lunch or whatever, but that doesn't apply to everyone. So here, this is going to make it specific to your situation. You write down what you're spending money on. At the end of the month, you can analyze those exp- uh, how you're spending it, and then you can see areas that you can cut back on. For us, this worked really well for us. Shortly after we got married, Tracy and I did this, and we said, gosh, we're eating breakfast out three times, or every weekend we were actually doing it. It's like, gosh, we we can save money. We don't need to do that, or going to the movies or whatever. But it becomes personal, and just, you know, small amounts add up really fast over time. And an easy example, let's just say Monday through Friday you eat lunch out every day. We'll say fast food. Keep it cheap. We'll say $5 a pop. Most of us aren't going to think twice about spending $5. We're not going to miss it. But add that up. $5 a day is $25 a week, which was $100 a month, which adds up to $1,300 a year. And a lot, for a lot of us, $1,300 can go a long way. So mm-hmm. that, to me, is just the number one key is just see where your money is going because there's two ways to make more money. Either, A, have to get a higher-paying job, which, let's face it, it's possible, but it's a little more difficult for most of us right now than it was five or six years ago. Or, B, we cut back what we're spending money on, which in tune puts more money back into our bank account. And then for your second question, what um, kind of makes us different? I just think for us, we don't have it all. Um, you know, we do have nice things. I have a 50-inch high-definition TV. I have, I think, a nice house. Um, we do have nice clothes, but we don't have it all. We're not able to go eat dinner out every single night. I'm not able to go buy a Mercedes. I'm not able to go buy whatever I want whenever I want. That, I think, to me is the difference is that we plan ahead. If we see something that we like, we want to go on vacation. We're going on vacation this summer, actually. We're going um, to, to a beach house for a week. So right now we're starting to save up money for it. Now, would we be able to go on vacation every single month? No, absolutely not. But we're making this sacrifice. So to save up money to do that, we may say, you know what, we're not going to go out to eat this Friday night. We're going to stay in instead. So just little things like that, I think that to me is the key to our success is just that we plan things out and we don't have it all. Have you have you given any, given any thought to possibly giving up your teaching career and focusing on personal finance education full time? Has, has anyone approached you about that? Yeah, I, I mean they haven't. There's kind of talks a uh, company that um that does the 403B plan for a school district. Um, they've kind of the owner of that has been in touch with me, and I've actually done some presentations with him. So it is something that might happen in the future. I, you know, it's kind of up to to the man upstairs. Uh, I, I just I kind of do what's ever in my power to to make that happen. So I don't know. I would really enjoy to do that. Um, 
just because I do feel there's such a desperate need. And, and like I said, even maybe if I eventually do write that book for parents to teach kids, something to get into schools to try to help children as well. So, yes, right. I mean, I'm definitely uh, – all ears for that, and we'll listen to, to something along those lines if something came up. But, um, you know, we're just working towards that and uh, just see what happens. Whatever's meant to be, I guess, uh, will, will happen. Well, well, Danny, this has been fantastic. And just kind of wrapping up here, what is at – the, at the Financial Bin, we focus on Generation Y. We focus on personal finance and entrepreneurship. What, in this tough economic time, what is one tip that you can pass on to Generation Y? Gosh, I just think you have to be careful. Um, you know, Generation Y, what we're seeing with the Occupy movement, kids graduating from college, getting a degree in, in English literature, owing $100,000 in student loan, and they can only find a job working at Starbucks as a barista. It just topped and one trillion bad. today. I, it came out. <laughs> Student loan debt. Yeah, there you go. And I think we have to be careful. When you're, when, when you're in high school, when you're getting ready to go to college, just think about your future. Don't just think about the next four years and how great it's going to be to have you know, uh, $20,000 to spend. You're not, you don't need it all for college, but you're going to blow the rest of it on keg parties and things like that. Of course, we all want to have fun, but you also have to realize down the road you're going to have to pay a price for that. It doesn't come for free. So I think right. that is kind of the biggest thing is just plan for your future. And if you can stay out of debt – Golly, it is so your life is so much easier because once you do get in that vicious cycle of having credit card debt, when you're paying 24% interest a year, you start racking that up, you're behind the eight ball, and it's much more difficult to get out from behind that than if you start off with a clean slate. So that's kind of where I would just just kind of plan ahead and envision where you want to be in a year, five years, ten years, and just make decisions based on that, and don't always worry about what other people think about you because you know what that person that you think has it all they could be going to bed at night having trouble sleeping having debt to collectors call them because they're twenty thousand dollars in debt and you think oh they got it all and you're trying to live up to them so just do what's right for you and then have a plan plan ahead of what you where you envision your life is going to be Danny that, that's really some great advice now last thing I want to I want to ask where can people get get in contact with you and buy your books um, probably the easiest way, um, if you just Google search my name, Danny Kofke, so D-A-N-N-Y, K-O-F as in Frank, K-E, and usually the first thing that comes up is my blog page. It's uh, dannykofke.blogspot.com, and on there there's uh, direct links to email me, direct link to order my both of my books. Um, also, uh, you can see some various uh, media things I've been on and learn a little bit more about me. All right, Danny. I, re- I really appreciate your time, and please, I, I would welcome you uh, welcome you when you when you release that that third book. I should say, mm-hmm. I would love to have you back on and, and give us more information about it. Awesome. I'd love to do it. Thanks so much for having me on, David. Thanks. You too. Uh, have a great weekend, Danny. Thank you so much. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye bye. All right, everybody. That was Danny Kofke, and Danny is the author of two personal finance books. How to Survive and Perhaps Thrive on a Teacher's Salary, and a simple book of financial wisdom, Teach Yourself and Your Kids How to Live Wealthy with Little Money. And as Danny mentioned, uh, he will be coming out with a third book, uh, hope, I'm, I'm assuming maybe uh, later this year or early next year, and that will be a book for parents about you know, how to teach your kids uh, about money and, and, and how to uh, you know, start your own life on the right track. Because as you heard, Danny is really a, a great parent and really teaching his kids uh, you know how to how to handle it because you know this is part of the reason we're in the mess we're in right now financially, um, and you know one of these days someone someone in Generation Y is going to be leading a country, and you probably want them to be able to handle their personal finances well before they they go and do that. Just ask France France and uh, and the pigs over in Europe. Uh, okay, well, I really, really appreciate your time tonight, guys. Uh, again, please make sure to follow FinancialBin.com for the latest on personal finance and entrepreneurial advice for Generation Y. And don't forget to pick up your copy of Entrepreneur Intervention. And please make sure to keep abreast of what we're doing with our the rest of the intervention series, both Landlord Intervention and Wealth Intervention. I want to thank you for your time. Till next time, my name is David Domzowski. Thank you for listening.